Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is an open session, so if you are watching us uh, via our website and participating in chat, then please type in your questions, type in your topics. Hi guys, um, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's sorry about session that. Is an open session, Always so if happens. you are watching us uh, via our website and participating in chat, then please the type in your questions, type window? in your topics. Hi guys, um, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's sorry about that. Is an open session. Oh my goodness. Always happens. Happens. Are watching us, uh, I'm sorry. I do not see where that is coming from. Hi everybody! I just uh, staged a coup while um, um, Adam is figuring out how to figure out his uh, what you call there. I muted them. Um, uh, we're going to have an open session tonight, and so please go on over to the um, um, uh, the astroimaging.channel.com and open up the chat area and uh, start uh, posting your questions that you might have and suggesting topics for us. Adam, you get we shake your head up and down if you're ready to go. Okay, you can be unmuted now. Yep. Yeah, that, okay. that happens every week, and uh, I, it is like uh, I don't know. It hurts my brain when that happens. I just hear everything I'm saying like a few seconds delay. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> an open an open session. Um, so again, type your questions into chat via our website, and uh, questions, topics you think we could discuss in five ten minutes. Um, or whatever it may be. Uh, but before we get into that, I am going to share my screen, my entire screen. And uh, hopefully I didn't kill that window that I needed. I think I did. But uh, as always, you can uh, see all of our image of the weeks. Got to get over there quickly before yeah. I hear my voice again. And that is not right. I am sorry. Uh, I'm going to fix this after the session, but what I'll do is I will show you the image of the week by Kamal Oz. Uh, it is <clears throat> NGC7293, the Helix Nebula. Got a, got to wink it down right here. Um, beautiful image. Uh, Kamal uh, did a great job on this one. Looks like a uh, narrow band image to me. Um, from where he is, targets low in the sky, and uh, there was a slight haze the, the, and a lot of humidity when he was imaging uh, using a carbon tubed F4 Newtonian uh, and a Canon T4i modified. So uh, maybe it is an art uh, uh, one shot color image. Uh, hey. Good job if you fooled me on that, taking a one shot that looks like an arrow band. I guess it is a bright target, but uh, still a very nice image. Let me close that off so you can see it again. But as always, you can go to our website, check these things out. And uh, one thing that I always like to see is you can click the little comment thing here and you can say, hey, come on. Great image. And send. Oh, make sure you say I'm not a robot. And then send, and bam, your comment will be uh, on there. Gives me a few seconds to approve it. And then uh, I don't know. We can get some uh, discussion going on the images there. And of course, then when they, if you do win, uh, you pop over to image of the week where I had tried to show it to you earlier. And you can check out all of our winners. Uh, you want to submit? Do it down at the bottom here. And that's that. Uh, keep submitting your images because we uh, we like having a lot of images here. Okay, camera coming back. So, uh, like I said, open session, um, and a few topics were posted already. Uh, we discussed quickly uh, flat frames. Uh, it's tough to go over it uh, in 
a open session like this because flat, flat frames uh, in some cases require uh, either a flat panel or some sort of light source and it's much easier to give you some sort of uh, picture or, or visual cues uh, rather than just discussing them because it's difficult to, well, unlike bias and dark frames, which are really easy to just kind of explain in 15 seconds what you have to do, uh, flat frames uh, require the hardware, the software, the exposure time to all kind of come together. And it takes some, uh, some effort on your part. So that would be a better one for a, uh, a full session. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we have done full sessions on flat frames. So if you're desperate to learn about flat frames, uh, go to go to YouTube, uh, go to our YouTube channel, and search for flat frames. You, the session will pop up. Uh, even if you just search for flat frames on YouTube, you'll probably find our session. Um, probably six six months to a year ago, we did it. Uh, so that said, uh, that one uh, we're gonna skip. Uh, and I'm going to move down. Uh, I had reviewed what we had gone over last week, and it does seem like we covered most of those topics. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to kind of move on. I have probably uh, one of the better questions that I've seen come in, or I should say the most common questions and easy to kind of go over in this. Uh, do we need to have our DSLs, DSLRs modified to capture nebula like the heart nebula? And I am going to say uh, you do not have to for some really bright nebula. But the heart nebula is, uh, I'm going to say, a borderline nebula. I have shot the heart nebula wide field with an unmodified camera, and then I shot it with a modified camera. And the difference was night and day. As a beginner, uh, you might be very happy with what you get out of your unmodified camera. And if you're just wetting your toes in uh, uh, astrophotography, then give it a shot. Uh, if it doesn't work out, hey, you learned something. Uh, it might work out just well enough that uh, you're content with your image. But uh, in general, if you're trying to push your images to get better and better, to capture any sort of emission nebula that isn't one of, I don't know, the three brightest nebula, then, then, uh, <laughs> sorry about that, then uh, you, you really should have a modified camera. Uh, in addition to that, we uh, were discussing a new product that's coming out that, uh, and we were discussing it for two minutes, so we haven't had a chance to kind of dig into it. But a new product that's coming out, a filter for narrowband imaging with a one-shot color camera. And uh, the, the, as our uh, thoughts started flowing, uh, we, we kind of thought that it might be more effective with a monochrome camera. But uh, as I understand it, that's not the primary intent of it. So uh, maybe we'll discuss that in a few seconds. Um, if, Nobody has anything to add to that particular question. Do we have any? Uh, do we need? Uh, I, I, as far as the uh, whether you should go to narrow band uh, or whether you should modify your DSLR, you never need to modify your DSLR. Okay, um, don't ever delay taking a picture of something because you're waiting for the modification or something like that. Always go on out and try it. You will get something. Um, one of the reasons, oh, you will get something, so go ahead and try it. Now, having said that, I do have an example of the differences between uh, modified and unmodified, but it takes a while for me to go through the files on my computer, pull it up and pop it up and show it to you. That's why, remember what Adam said, that some of the very good topics you guys have suggested they're not open session topics because we can't just like say, oh yeah, this, that, the other thing. We need to be able to illustrate it and it's very confusing. Meanwhile, I'll go back to looking for that while you guys go ahead with other, with some other topic and then I'll interrupt you later and show you that particular slide, okay? The I'll difference between, between hydrogen alpha and not uh, modified and not modified. 
Okay. Um, and he's upset because his Pix Insight trial is about to expire. Just pay for it. You're going to need it. Um, <laughs> the biggest mistake I made was downloading the Pix Insight trial. Because I downloaded the trial. I've said this before on the channel. I downloaded the trial and I looked at it and I was like, what is this? This isn't easy. This is very difficult. Uh, the, in my experience, it takes you longer than the trial period to learn how to definitely be proficient in Pix Insight, but mostly to just understand it enough to really get through uh, a whole image. Um, you would you would need about a year and a half trial period. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and well, you're not going to um, know anything in a month. Adam, let me let me add a couple of comments. I mean, everyone's experience is different, but I picked up Pix Insight and put it down three times, each time saying, I don't get this. And the fourth time, I decided to learn one thing. And when I learned one thing, that was the door that was open that allowed me to start to understand what they're talking about. And I don't say I recommend that for everyone because everyone learns in their own particular way. But you can do that all in 30 days. You can go through and pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down, and eventually kind of get it, kind of open the door for you. I think part of the problem is when, you know, we use Photoshop, and then we switch to Pix Insight, and then we try to look for the same tool to do the same job. In fact, in Pix Insight, it's a completely, you got to look at it like, hey, this is the result I want. What tool do I use to get to that result? Not particular the maybe the same tool. Uh, th that's what confuses. Uh, that's what confused me, anyways, when I started it, because I was looking for the same tool. Like, how do I do this? I do something in Photoshop and turn around. How do I do the same exact thing? Well, that tool doesn't exist there. Yeah, I'll add to the same thing. I think it's, it's similar to what you're saying, Tolga, but I think a lot of people have some sort of experience with a, a typical graphical editor, be it, be it GIMP or Photoshop or one of the other types of clones like that. And it's one of those things that, you know, once you've kind of built up that experience over years, it's hard to kind of shake and switch to something different. And so you start getting into these effects, well, I know how to do this. Where why can't I do this in PI and Pix Insight, right? And people start getting confused and things like that. And um, you know, not not having massive documentation early on, that didn't help. Now we, we at least have a book from Warren, and you know, there's more documentation inside the tool itself, which is helpful. But um, and there's been lots of tutorials here and there, so it does make it easier. But certainly, it is diff much different than most other programs. Well, let's be honest. Uh, most of us don't read manuals. You know, raise your hand if you read manuals. I certainly don't. But there are a number of videos which will get you started with PixInsight. I think we all are used to watching videos. And playing a video and following along will get you off the snide on PixInsight, in my humble opinion. I, I, um, and and I, I don't know if you guys want to say uh maybe like i can't follow written instructions on software i don't know if it's me but software like if it's a furniture that i need to put together that's fine but software i can't i you know it says let's say it gives it a name of the tool you just don't know where to go it's like i don't know i don't know if it's me or it's a common problem i can't follow written instructions on software uh, it's you tolga very well be um, no, I, could I, I, can I, I say something? No, it's not you, Tolga. It's all of us. We all, we're all the same. Could I say something here? Go um, ahead. Yeah. Um, two things. One is that I face that very problem, just like everybody does. I think everybody, unless you're, you're, you've grown up in the semi-engineering field where you use the kind of in interface that Pix Insight does, um, you have problems. Curiously, many people who grew up in that um, uh, way of using software don't seem to have nearly as many problems as the rest of us do. But um, I once upon a time had a guy come over to my house and said that he wanted to learn how to use Pix Insight, and I said, you know, you you, you just can't do that. But I but I said to myself, how do I figure this out so that I can actually get this guy to get through an entire 
processing session. And maybe he won't understand what's all that's happening, but give him some certain steps that he can go by route by rote and just just do these things and get himself a picture. And in going through that, he could learn a little bit about it. And so we did a couple of shows just on that particular idea where uh, don't worry about why I'm telling you to do this kind of thing. Just realize that this is the tool you want to use and these are about the settings you want to use on it. And it turns out that in PixInsight, you can get a much better picture very quickly compared to getting it out of Photoshop with Deep Sky Stacker or anything else like that. You really can get a better picture more quickly uh, using PixInsight as long as you don't have to think about all those different things that you're trying to do. So we've got that we've got that show back on the astroimaging channel there's actually two of them one for doing it in um one shot color and one for doing it in um uh monochrome and you can also get it off my website at alex astro um it's called jug picks inside jug of milk or bottle of wine or something like that a loaf of uh, bread loaf of bread yeah that's what it was okay anyway it's a while ago that we did it now remember i promised i would bring up a slide you guys see my screen here uh, you guys see the yes. panel? okay see the california nebula down here that's a nice picture and i didn't pay an extra four hundred dollars i didn't do this at all takayuki yoshida did it and he took this picture of the california nebula with an unmodified camera and then took an identified modified camera and took this other picture over here on the right hand side so you can see that you don't need a modified camera to take a picture of the California nebula, or you can insert almost any other kind of nebula there. But it does make for a more, a more better picture. You can see more of the, the hydrogen alpha, which is what really needs to be emphasized there. So that's just going back. And, and that's why, and this incidentally is from a show that has already been on the Astroimaging channel. So you can go back and find it someplace. I forget what it was called. Um, this is moving from one shot, no, moving from DSLR to um, CCD. That's what that one was about. Okay, I'm finished. Okay, um, I guess I'll, I'll weigh in on the whole Pix Insight thing. It is a lot easier today than it was three or five or seven years ago to learn Pix Insight because there's just that many more resources. Uh, getting into, uh, this is an interesting topic that kind of popped into my mind that uh, Eric and Tolga were speaking to. Um, some people want to watch a YouTube video with step-by-step -step instructions. Some people want that list of instructions on paper, no pictures. Some people need illustrations. Um, everybody learns differently and everybody picks up on stuff differently. Uh, but I do think that the, the technical nature of Pix Insight does, even though uh, we're talking about a visual product, um, the, the technical nature of Pix Insight allows you to do a step by step instruction. And at first, it helps to go through those step by step instructions. Not so much to produce the image as, as it is, as you're going through those step by step instructions, you're learning the terminology that Pix Insight uses. And their terminology can be confusing. Um, in some cases, I think they arbitrarily picked words and threw them together to come up with an idea. Uh, sure, color calibration makes sense. Um, but what the heck is TGBD noise? Uh, what wavelets okay? I'll give you a, I'll give you a little bit there. Uh, uh, Atrus wavelet transform. What what the heck is Atrus? But uh, in 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 reality, you have to use Pix Insight a bit to learn it, and you have to learn Pix Insight to use it. So you get stuck in that kind of catch twenty two. Um, I would I've said it before, and I'll say it again. And I'm not just trying to help uh, Warren sell books, even though it gives me two dollars for every book he sells. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, his book is amazing, and it should have been out uh, years ago. Uh, the Pix Insight developers keep developing tools; they don't necessarily uh, put out the most comprehensive documentation with each tool they come out with. Uh, they really expect the, their user's technical knowledge to kind of overcome the difficulty in it. Um, 
so you're going to use Pix Insight. Uh, in fact, if you go to Alex's video, a loaf of bread, a jug of milk, and Pix Insight, uh, you are going to find you're going to see a process for spitting an image out of Pix Insight in I don't know 10, 15 minutes. And that image, uh, in, in most cases, is going to be as good as what you would get out of Photoshop. In some cases, it could be better. Uh, I find the stacking tools, um, even though batch pre-processing script warning, don't use this because it's not as good as doing it manually, uh, batch pre-processing script does a great job on its own of stacking and calibrating your images. Um, can you do a better job manually? Yes. Uh, can you do a better job manually on your first outing? I don't think so. Uh, probably not until you understand everything that's going on uh, will you be able to manually produce a better image. And for me, I, I, I know I worked on, I, I actually didn't know batch preprocessing script existed. And I was trying to do it manually. And I was reading the instructions. And I was reading the instructions. And I was reading in the instructions. And uh, I calibrated. Um, I uh, star aligned. Uh, I stacked them. Uh, I uh, image integrated, as, as they called it. And uh, then I had my individual channel. Uh, then I needed to do that three times. Then I combined them to uh, produce a nonlinear image. Uh, all these things you're doing. Uh, that are new to you are confusing. And uh, even if you hear someone say it, uh, well, this is what nonlinear is, and you want to keep it nonlinear, or excuse me, this is what linear is, and you want to keep it linear until you uh, do decide to take it nonlinear. Uh, what the heck does that mean? Well, when you do it in practice a few times, you, you start to learn what you're doing. It is like, uh, it's like learning to, uh, like learning to write in first grade, uh, you don't go into class, learn to write, and then come out the next day and uh, write a novel. You're, you're there doing it for years and years and years. And by the time you get to third grade, you're proficient enough to write your story or whatever it may be. Um, but it's more about learning what each learning the terminology, learning what each tool does, then getting a bit more proficient in each individual tool, uh, possibly even learning where each tool is appropriate to use and at what point in the process each tool is, is, is supposed to be used. Um, three to six months after you start using it, uh, you're going to be putting out much better images than you can with just about any other program, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, a year after you've been using it, uh, not only are you going to put them put out better images, but you're going to do it quicker. You're going to have a very particular routine, and at the very end of the process, uh, you may still bring that image into Photoshop and do some uh, make it sparkle. But in general, it's the whole process is a learning process, and that's what you have to get through. Um, when I was, uh, when I was going to graduate, you know, I was looking for something to graduate from Deep Sky Stacker. You know, you look at the software that's available. I mean, I actually looked at, you know what, um, the, the factor that made me select um, Pix Insight was you guys. Not just you guys, but the, the whole community. Because everybody's using it. Like, for instance, if you wanted to go, so, you know, you go CCD stack right now, who are you going to call for help if you get stuck? Yeah. Um, thanks, Tolga. Hey, um, I have two things to say. One is, uh, I, re I remember the first time I was in Germany, and I kept, you know, trying to figure out where I was on the map, and there were, was Einbahnstrasse, and I couldn't find that on my map, and then I went around uh, another couple blocks, and there was another Einbahnstrasse. I said, did, did I go in a circle? It took me a while to realize that, oh, Einbahnstrasse just means one-way street, and so all these signs that were marked that way. Or imagine you've just driven into a town, you do not know what is important and what is not important in all these signs. So you're reading every single sign trying to figure out what, what everything is saying. And you can't 
you can't drive safely and read all these signs. But compare that to your, your drive home this afternoon, and you know what all those signs say. You know what you're very familiar with everything. You skip reading most of those signs anymore, so you can just get through it. The second thing I want to say is, and who could go a whole meeting without me advertising something? Um, remember, if you want to meet the guy who wrote the book about Fix Insight, you can go to telescopes.net. And uh, for 50 bucks, you can come on out and visit with us next weekend. I'll be cooking breakfast starting at 8 o'clock. Lunch is, I think, pizza arriving at about noon. And uh, dinner is, I don't know yet, chicken or, or barbecue um, hamburgers. But uh, come on out to GMARS next week for 50 bucks. You can hang around with Warren Keller all day. And um, it ought to be a good trip. I ought to have some fun. Pancakes so. and Picks Insight. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to browse down a bit, but uh, I did get a good question I, uh, from Zach. So I've had an Atlas AZ EQ6 GT, uh, the equivalent of the Atlas Pro, uh, for about a year, uh, regularly guiding at 0.5 to 0.6 RMS at 700 focal length with an off-axis guider. Mostly happy with it, but every now and then it seems to lose its mind and doesn't guide well for unknown reasons, possibly seeing. Will I notice a big difference going to something like a Mach 1? Uh, it depends. Um, if it is coming from seeing, no. Um, if, if your problem is legitimately seeing, then you won't really see much of a difference. In fact, uh, you might be expecting uh, the, the RMS to drop considerably. And it possibly will uh, if the error is coming from the mount. Uh, that said, what the what what premium mounts do is per particularly the well particularly premium mounts. Um, they give you a little confidence that your mount is working the way it should be, and the issue is potentially coming from somewhere else. Uh, I drove the. Uh, the astrophysics guys nuts because uh, I was seeing a lot of jumping on my uh, PhD graph and um, it was just seeing. Uh, it was, I think at the time I had upgraded to a new version of PhD and maybe there was something different in the code there that was causing it to be a little bit more sensitive to slight changes. Um, Maybe I didn't carry over a setting from the old version. Um, that said, uh, a better mount, a mount that ha that's more precise, uh, that has better gearing, uh, uh, more finely machined gears, uh, is not going to cause as much error to come from the actual gears. Uh, so. Uh, and I, I will say I will say this to uh, astrophysics: um, they're they're a pretty much bulletproof mounts. Uh, there, there's very little that can go wrong with it that can't be fixed out in the dark in the middle of the night. Uh, you might need a flashlight. You might need to reseat the motors, uh, but they've made that very simple. Um, so it's hard for me to say, yes, upgrade your mount and all of your troubles will disappear. Uh, but uh, if you do upgrade your mount, uh, you're, you're, if you upgrade your mount and you're having the same troubles, then it probably wasn't your mount. Um, I think uh, that, that's probably the best I could say in regards to that. Uh, I've been using my Mach 1 for... So long now, I basically forgot all the issues I used to have uh, with my non-optimal imaging setup. And I, it was very non-optimal. Uh, I was using a fork mount uh, with error, uh, I don't know, I think I was like uh, 18 arc seconds of periodic error. Uh, it's It wasn't for imaging. Um, uh, the new Atlas Pros are pretty good, but uh, you get what you pay. You get what you pay for. 
Now, you may have to pay a lot to get a little when you're talking about premium mounts, uh, but uh, it's, it speaks more to the effort that goes into building the, the mount, the gearing, uh, specifically the gears. Uh, I mean, they're, uh, they're machined to much higher tolerances than uh, mounts that are coming from uh, overseas, from large factories that uh, I won't say mass produced, but produced for the mass market. Um, so uh, hard to say whether you will notice a difference, uh, but uh, will you appreciate the difference? I think you will. Uh, if you're spending every last dime on the mount and you're expecting the world from it, you may not get what you're expecting. If you want to eliminate a lot of your headaches, then uh, I, I think a premium mount is the way to go. If you're if you're in it for the long haul, if you've been doing this for a few years and you're hitting those limits of your uh, mount, um, if you're spending more time tuning your mount than you are imaging, uh, then yeah, it's probably time for a premium mount. Uh, that is. That is I'll, I'll make a. I'll make a small. So just, and I, just all I want to say is that uh, using a premium mount is not just a luxury. You're just not getting a like a luxury car versus a regular car that both do the same thing. You really like you know professional mechanics use Snap On and we use Craftsman. Reason why, you know, can a can a craft Craftsman socket do the same thing? Yes, but it's not just a luxury. You're not just it's not just a name. So. It, they are better. Yeah. I mean, every every step of the way. Actually, the thing that I appreciate about astrophysics is y you can basically break it down and look at what's going on. Uh, you can look at the motors, and there there's some complex parts in there, but it's fairly simple. If you're the type of person that likes to take stuff apart to see how it works, uh, you're going to look at this, and you're going you're gonna to see the gearing, and you're going to say, ooh, they, they did a good job on this, the motor boxes. Oh, these are heavy and nice. Um, so it isn't just a luxury. Every step of the way, uh, even, uh, even the fit and finish of the uh, astrophysics or even uh, paramounts, uh, you, you can see a clear difference between that and what you're going to get for a third or a quarter of the price. Adam, and, let me go just ahead. add a couple of things. I've... I actually went from an Atlas mount to a Mach 1 and used it for a few years before we actually traded for something bigger. And, you know, you've said everything correct about the premium mounts, but the thing that, that impressed me most and was most enjoyable is that the mount just disappeared. The mount was never an issue. It was always about something else, and I never had to worry about it. And it was dependable, precise. And if anything went wrong, which was usually my fault, not the mount, right? Who do you call? You call George. And George patiently walks you through every issue, even though he knows it's your fault and you know it's your, your fault. He is patient and eventually you figure it out. I'm not sure who you call for an Atlas mount when something goes wrong. So I'm a big proponent of, I don't want to say premium mounts, but of astrophysics mounts to this day. They just disappear. Yeah, I haven't talked to anybody at AP about anything wrong since like maybe Friday. And they didn't even bother going all the way back to George. The receptionist answered the phone and said, well, what was the problem? And I told her about the battery warning. And she says, oh, no, that's not it. And it was all done. I mean, everybody there knows what they're doing. And uh, yeah, the mount's just wonderful. But anyway, we it's seven oh five or ten oh five, depending on where you are. Let's see what other questions we got in there. Okay, okay, Ryan Eckstein. Here is my latest pick. Tell me what you guys. Oh, it's not coming up for me. Why not? Uh, I have no idea why not. That was a really odd error message. Um, oh, it's a tiff. Uh, Ryan, I don't believe uh, uh, Rumble Talk supports tips in chat. 
Uh, yeah, LinkedIn will work for me. I see it. Uh, so if you, there we go. I guess I had to scan down a couple. Um, nice image. Let me let me screen share this for those who aren't seeing this in chat. Uh, okay, so Ryan, you shared it. Now we're gonna now we're gonna tear it apart. Uh, where is that window? Uh, there we go. I think you can see it. Uh, stop me if you can't see it. So a uh, great image of a great target, M81 and M82. Um, you, you did a good job. Uh, now, depending on where you are in your imaging, if, if this was one of my, uh, one of the images I took in the first, I don't know, three to five years of imaging, I'd be jumping up and down happy with it. Um, <clears throat> being where I am in imaging, uh, I can I can critique this, and I would say, well, I see a bit of chro chromatic noise. Um, there's some star elongation, which to me looks more like. Let me see the optics as opposed to anything wrong with the system, because it all appears to be uh, emanating from the center. Um, to me, it looks like you could use some more time on it. Uh, I don't think the signal is as uh, is as uh, strong as it could be. Uh, I don't know the details behind this image, um, but basically, uh, it's a great image. Uh, as as Alex says, who's your audience? Are you going to show this to a bunch of imagers who? Uh, basically critique their own images until they're uh, until they've just torn everything apart or are you going to show this to your coworkers and uh, your church group or whoever it may be uh, you're going to impress a whole heck of a lot of people i will tell you this 80 80 to 90 percent of the people you show this to are going to say no you didn't take this image uh and you're going to say no yeah i did and they said but it's a galaxy what do you, are you using the hubble telescope and you say no you can take these images from your from your driveway. And they say, no, you can't. You're lying. Uh, so it's, it's a very good image. Uh, the things I would work on, I'm not going to tell you to correct your optics because I don't like spending other people's money. Uh, but uh, better optics would probably fix some of that uh, radial elongation. Uh, more time would probably get more signal on it. And when you get more signal, a little bit, when you have a higher signal to noise ratio, um, you will be able to bring out more detail. Uh, there's a lot of dark structure covering the central area of the galaxy here. And that, uh, when, when I shoot this galaxy, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to both bring out the dark the dark lanes on the inside of the galaxy while also maintaining those long arms on the outside of the galaxy. So you did a good job. Uh, but if you want to improve it, I would, I don't know how long this image, uh, how long, how much time you had into this image, but try doubling the time, try quadrupling the time. Uh, if you have three hours into it, go for 12 hours. Uh, See, see what comes out. At some point, you're going to say, not only are you going to say, you know, I think I made this image nicer. I think what you're going to say to yourself is, you know, I made this image a lot easier to process because a high signal to noise ratio image is just that much easier to work with. You've got a lot more stuff there. Uh, when you try and reveal Lane, uh, dust lanes or dim arms of a spiral galaxy, you're also revealing a lot of the chromatic noise. You're also bringing out a lot of the noise. So you have to get rid of the noise as early on in the process as possible. And the way to do that is uh, lots of exposure time, proper calibration. It looks like you have the calibration, at least the flat calibration right, based on that radial elongation. Uh, I am going to say you probably took flat frames. Uh, I'm not looking at, at the uh, chat box, but he's got some information. 
Um, okay. Uh, you had uh, 74 uh, second, second images, 50, 50 darks. darks. Uh, uh, I think he said 50, 50 flats, but then he corrected and said 50 bias, no flats. No flats. Interesting. It's um, using a 70 Mark II. Interesting. So it's if if you aren't using flats, then you probably did a good job with gradient correction, but um, uh, my personal opinion is uh, if you were using flats, you wouldn't have to use that gradient correction, and you would probably preserve a bit more detail and probably be able to reduce the noise a bit more. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to close. You've, you've, you've seen the image enough. I'm going to close out that window just so I could get back to the details. Um, we were talking about the M31 that's posted over in the comments, right? Because yet on the screen, it appeared to me that we were actually showing somebody's somebody else, something else. Ryan Ryan posted two images. He posted the M81, M82, and then an M31 image. Okay, and we were we were speaking just now of the M31. M81. Uh, M81. Okay. Well, no wonder some of your comments didn't. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's unclear if the the times and number of darks and flats apply to the M31 or or uh, M81, M82 image, but I'm scanning down. I, I still don't see the details, but I'm going as fast as I can. They're oh yeah, at the bottom. There's the M3. There's the M31. Um, 70, 40 second images, 50 darks, 50 flats. Uh, I don't know your uh, light pollution levels. To me, the 40 second sounds a little bit low, and that could have something to do with the uh, noise in the image. At the same time, um, y you know, a lot of us would put 12, 20, 30, 40 hours into an image like this. Um, more, you know what I'm going to suggest to you, Ryan? Um, see if you can find any data posted that you can process on your own uh, from someone with a really, uh, really long exposure time, like just really uh, in-depth image. I know we've posted them in the past. There's probably some in our uh, in past programs, but I, off the top of my head, I'm not coming up with some. I know Eric has volunteered data. Let me think about this. I don't remember the title of the, of the program. Um, but try processing data for an image that, uh, that has 20 hours of exposure time. Ryan, um, it seems like way back before we even posted the M31 picture, you posted a comment, your question, something to the effect of, um, of uh, hey, it looks like I'm going to have to do a mosaic with this. Has anybody got any? Yeah, there it is. Uh, shooting Andromeda with my setup Canon DSLR and 115 millimeter refractor. I'll have to do a mosaic. What's everyone's experience with creating a mosaic? And I don't think we've addressed that part of your question. Um, yeah, if you want to fit M31 uh, in that particular scope, and the example that you've given us is M31, um, and yeah, you got the edges cut off, and one has to wonder, so like, what's out there just past that, the part, why did you pick that part? Why didn't you get the whole thing? Well, one way around that problem is to create a mosaic. Another way may be to have rotated your camera somewhat so that the long axis of the galaxy crosses the, across the diagonal, which is the longest axis you have in your uh, frame. Uh, so that's one thing to consider when you're taking a picture is if you can change the orientation of your camera, you might be able to get more, uh, just a better composition overall. Um, but uh, having said that, I don't think you'd fit it in even then. And if it were fit in, it would be squoze in. It would be squoze in so badly that people would say, it's still squashed. It's still squashed in there. Uh, so yeah, you're going to have to make a mosaic. Now, I can almost guarantee you that most of the people will say, 
before you start making a mosaic, go to Sequence Generator Pro for $99 and purchase for an additional $50 the Mosaic Maker. And uh, I think, oh, I've only done one of them for reels. And uh, uh, I, I just don't get into mosaics too much. But the one I did, it worked very well. What you do is you call up an area of space, or you call up a, a picture from, I think, the Palomar Sky Survey, uh, and it's five degrees across in each direction. And you see Andromeda or whatever it is you want to take a picture of. And then you draw a box around what you want to get and how you want it framed. And then you specify just how many different um, uh, panels you want in your mosaic. You want it to be two by two, four by four, uh, eight by eight, nine by three, whatever it is you want to do. And um, oh, I wish somebody would go ahead and just call it up on the old screen. I, and, I am doing it right now. Yeah, okay, there you go. And as you can see, it's really not all that difficult to do. I mean, Adam can do it just like this. Well, we're just sitting here, he can do that. And it will then generate a series of coordinates for you to take pictures of. And if if the coordinate of Andromeda is is right there, you know that's where it's centered in its center. Um, you you go. Um, it, it'll actually tell tell you to aim up to the upper left, uh, center upper center. You know, right, and there it goes, right like that. And you can tell how many he's gonna. How many are you gonna take there? Tw Eighteen pictures. Twenty. This is my long focal length setup. So let me. You know what? This was actually a question that was suggested. Um, so let me do this uh, a little bit in depth because this is probably one of the most valuable tools in Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, I am my configuration right now is set up for uh, my uh, 10 inch RC. Uh, I believe uh, yes, this is with the reducer. Um, this, these are my equipment profiles. So all of my telescopes that I have. Uh, it, Basically, each configuration stores particular setup uh, settings in Sequence Generator Pro, so you don't have to type them in every si every time. Uh, this is a long focal length setup, so I wouldn't shoot Andromeda with this. I would shoot Andromeda with my Star 71 and my STF um, 8300. Uh, here we go. I pulled that up. Uh, no sequences created. So now that I'm using my new sequence, uh, my new profile, I go in. Uh, I pick the field of view that I want this screen to be. Uh, I'm going to check. I'm going to take uh, four degrees just so I know I'm going to get a lot of stuff in the frame. M31 is a large target. Uh, I just type M31 in and I fetch it. It pulls it up. Uh, I can change the brightness of the image just to make it so that I can see it a little bit better. And now, look, that's only two frames. Uh, probably should have made it more than four degrees field of view, but two frames will fit that nicely. Uh, let's say I just, I wanna see, can I fit it into one single frame? Uh, I'm gonna redraw the target rectangle and see what it looks like in one frame. Try rotating it a bit. I can rotate it. And then you how rotate it across want, across the want, uh, diagonal. Yeah, how do I want this to be? Do I want it to be across the diagonal? Uh, rotate it like that. Drag my box a little bit more. I'll tell you, uh, this particular feature allows you to get really creative with your framing. Um, one of the things I really like doing is jumping deep inside of Nebula. You look at the Heart Nebula. Yeah, it looks like a heart, but what does it look like on the interior of it? There are lots of different regions within the Heart Nebula, within all different Nebula, that just by using some creative framing, you can really have a dramatic photograph. And this tool lets you do that without really putting a lot of effort into it, really just by looking at it and saying, I like the way that looks. I'm going to give this a try. And then, bam, you've got it. Um, the I would question uh, right off the bat. I would question even going to the mosaic in the first place. I think the best, better thing to do for somebody who's starting is to pick your target that's going to fit your field of view, or do a part of the target like you're talking about. I I think mosaics are 
extremely difficult to do. Right, they are. But Tolga, remember, um, everybody wants to take a picture of M31. It's a rule. You, you have to take a picture of M31. And if you want to get a picture of M31 and you've got a, a C8 or, a, you know, an LX208 inch, you've got a small field of view and you're going to have to use a mosaic to get it properly. But you're right. The proper thing to do is what Adam just did and change telescopes. Yeah. It's yeah. Or, or as Tolga said, eh, you can't take that picture with that particular setup without going mosaic. So Tolga's right. But um, we want to take a picture of M31. But we've only gotten Ryan halfway there. Ryan, what's happened is that we've got a picture of, uh, and you saw earlier that we had a two mosaic picture here, um, and uh, or two panel mosaic for a picture. Now you've taken the pictures because Sequence Generator Pro has told you exactly where to aim your camera and uh, told you, you know, it has taken two sets of sub subframes. Now you've got to put them together. And I think there are many ways to do that. Most of us would do it nowadays in Pix Insight, where there is a set of, um, of procedures there that allow you to register your images and to balance them out in such a way that they all stitch together nicely. But you can also do it in Photoshop by using layers on a particularly large canvas. Um, so, but to answer that whole set of questions in, a, um, in an open session like this is a little difficult. It it's probably took, would take a good long show, and I think that's a good, a good example of maybe we should make a show out of that, okay? Um, so there. So I jumped way down into the uh, chat, and I got a qu another question that uh, relates right to this. Uh, well, more to Sequence Generator Pro. Does the Sequence Generator Pro Mosaic Wizard help with things that would require HDR? And I think what you're asking is, um, do, uh, for bright objects. Well, we're looking at it. Uh, the center of M31 is a relatively bright region it's no orion but it's a relatively bright uh, region and uh, if you uh well i know jerry rodriguez has a great uh tutorial on this particular nebula and how you get the core yeah blown out core exactly how you get the core to not blow out while you're actually well while you're also revealing those outer uh very far outer dust lanes it, this this galaxy goes way out beyond what we can see here. And it, in a sense, uh, well, first of all, no, the Mosaic Wizard doesn't. But uh, very simply, you can do this yourself. Uh, let me create this sequence. I'm going to create this sequence here. Well, go, go, go back to having two panels or three panels. So it, otherwise, gotcha. you're just, yeah. otherwise gotcha. you're just taking a picture. OK. Uh, Draw the target rectangle. Oops. Oops. Forgot. Just change back to your other telescope. There you go. That'll do. There we go. So there we go. I've got two panels on the mosaic. I'm gonna create now change your change your rotation. That looks goofy. Oh come on. I'm not really shooting it. Okay, let me change rotation. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That'd be interesting. Um so I'm gonna create this sequence. Let me it lets me name it however I would want. It also gives me a few different options. Auto-rotate or validate rotation on mosaic start, because remember, this relies on the actual rotation of your camera on the back of the telescope. You don't have to have a rotator. There's a manual rotation feature, but it, it require if you have a rotator, it does it for you. If you don't have a rotator, yes, you're gonna have to rotate your camera until it basically aligns with what it expects the alignment to be here. Um, slew to the target and then center. So precision centering with plate solving precisely centers on the object. So night after night, you're always going to go right to that object. Uh, going to take a picture, make sure it's looking at exactly the right spot, going to correct it, and then start your session. Um, so uh, let me just click OK. It's going to create the targets. And I go down here, and you can see... Uh, this target set one is just a default target, so I can go right in, uh, right in and delete that. 
uh, delete target. Right below it, frame one, frame two. So your, your question is about HDR. So let's, for simplicity's sake, I'm using a monochrome camera here, but let's say I'm using an RGB camera. I'm going to say take one sub, one light, uh, RGB camera, no filters. Let's say two, let's say five minutes, uh, no binning. Let's say I want to take 30 exposures um, at five minutes, remember. Now, you asked about HDR. Well, we need to take a short image for the core. That might be 30 seconds. And I still want a lot of them. Let me take 30 of them. You know what? It's only 30 seconds. Let me take 45 of them to kind of reduce the noise. You know, maybe let me take 60 of them. 30 seconds, it's going to get me a higher signal to noise ratio. Uh, Although the core will be bright, so my signal to noise ratio on the core is going to be pretty good. But you can play with this. Um, and then basically, that's set up. I want to make sure I do it for the second panel. So I've got the same uh, thing going on here. I'm going to be running both of these. Uh, what was I at? Five minutes, 30, 30 seconds, 30, 60. Uh, and, it, I, and, and incidentally, you can copy all of the uh, events from the first sec, uh, first sequence target into the second target with using some. Yeah, there we go. There you go. So you, you, you don't have to enter by hand. Yep. Um, so there, you've got the exact same sequence. Uh, but that right there is where you get the HDR from. You have to obviously do some processing afterwards. But you, you know what? This is this is. Astrophotography software designed by astrophotographers. I click run sequence and my telescope loose to the object, plate solves it, runs through all of these subs, runs through all of these subs. I, I should be on here. Runs through all these subs, runs through all these subs, switches to this one, plate solves it, recenters it, and then runs through the sequence again. And I don't have to watch it. I don't have to worry about it. Flips on the meridian. And basically, I'm asleep when this is happening. When it gets done with these, it parks itself. Uh, it turns off the cooler on my camera. It basically does everything but powers down the mount. Uh, I believe that if I wanted to power down the mount, I could do it. Uh, I think that there is a script at the end. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I thought they added some sort of script where you can power down your mount with it. But, uh, yeah. Uh, Adam, I actually have a question about SGP and the Mosaic Wizard and this whole thing that yep. you just created. I'm actually doing a mosaic myself right now. Uh, what I find difficult is what's, what I have already and what's left. Does C SGP take care of that? Like, If you were able to do half of that tonight and you're going to do the rest of it tomorrow, does it know, okay, I'm done with these, and, but these are still left in, the, in that sequence that you created? Yes. Yes. So uh, let me go to whatever I'm working on now. And you can, you're going to, oops, you are going to immediately see how long it's been since the last time I was imaging. Uh, I believe I have some subs on this. Yeah. So NGC 7380, the Wizard Nebula. Um, I have already taken 18 subs in H-alpha, and I still need 15, 15, and 15 for RGB. Don't ask me why I'm shooting H-alpha RGB on NGC 7380. Well, I can tell you why, because I don't have my other narrowband filters in my camera yet. I have to put them in, and that's been my biggest holdup and why I haven't been imaging, because I know I have to put the filters in the camera before I can really do anything effective, and I've been too lazy to get the filters in the camera, or at least switch my filters. But yeah, so um, it remembers that I took 18 of those subs. Normally, I could just leave that checked and it would finish these, then move on to this, then move on to this, then move on to this. Uh, if it stopped here, it would just stop there, and it would say, okay, you still have to take six subs here and 15 subs here, and uh, it'll let me move on. Uh, you'll see over here. Uh, That's a nice feature. I'm sorry? That's a nice feature, I said. Yes, yes. Uh, SH2104, uh, you can see I completed it. 
Um, so uh, I must have completed on, on my last imaging run because uh, it's completed. Uh, it says, uh, I don't know, for some reason it doesn't know it's completed. Oh, yeah, because I just, well, I'm not quite sure why. Maybe the status was completed. Maybe something happened. But uh, basically, let's say at the beginning of the night, I want to shoot M82. At the end of the night, I want to shoot 7380. Uh, M82, uh, I need uh, uh, nine more subs of R, uh, 10 more subs of G, 10 more subs of B. Then when it finishes with that, it's going to jump over to 7380, take my two subs, and then start working on the RGB. Uh, let's say. I have some sort of, let's say I have an imperfect system. Uh, I might have focus or flex. I might have something. Um, I would choose to rotate through the, uh, uh, let's say I'm shooting RGB, and it's kind of sensitive to where in the sky it's, it's shooting. I would rotate through the events. So it's going to shoot an H alpha, then an R, then a G, then a B. So any uh, difference in the light, uh, in the, uh, light pollution uh, or the light dome uh, pointing straight up is a little bit darker than pointing a bit on the horizon. It's going to average that out by rotating through the events. Let's say I'm shooting narrow band and it's not very sensitive to that. I'll just finish the entire event first. It'll shoot all of my H alpha. Then it'll move on to my O3 because I'm shooting narrow band. Let's jump up here. Nope, not going to do it because my RGB, oh yeah, it's all. these are all RGB uh, sequences. Um, so that's why I, I'm rotating through my events because I do want to average out uh, that light indifference between the filters. It's basically, I don't know, it basically is designed to do everything we could possibly want it to do. Uh, oh. I love Sequence Generator Pro. I'm okay. Jamie, happy. Jamie, your question up there was uh, does the mosaic help with things that would require HDR? Um, what I think, uh, well, well, what Adam just explained is it helps point your camera, uh, the mosaic wizard does. It points your camera and rotates your rotator, if you've got one, to where you need to be in order to pick up the panels. Um, but that positioning is not generally dependent on the brightness of the object. Uh, SGP itself helps you take multiple exposures at different exposure levels so that it will help you with get, gather your subframes for your HDR project. But the Mosaic Wizard itself doesn't. I also wanted to point out that um, we've only gone to the first step in taking the pictures here, and there are other ways to do it besides the Mosaic Wizard. By far, most of us would be using something like the SGP's Mosaic Wizard, but you can also take Carts to Ciel, the, uh, the Sky X or any of those programs that you might want to use and make yourself a field of view uh, indicator and see how big the field of view of your telescope is compared to the object itself. And you can move that field of view around the object, which is essentially what the Mosaic Wizard is doing in SGP. And you can find out exactly where you're pointed at any one point. So you can take your M31 and cover it with six fields of view, making sure you overlap it to some extent because you need to overlap when you're doing a mosaic. And you just figure out exactly what the pointing coordinates are for that particular object. And then you go with, use whatever software you normally use to acquire images and just point your telescope using the pointing coordinates you got out of the Sky X or Carts to Ciel or, or uh, any of those other kinds of planetarium programs. So yeah, that that's we would do it with SGP, but there are other ways to do it if you didn't want to invest the $149 that it would take to do it with the Mosaic Wizard. Okay? Awesome. Um, I do see we're at 1035 Eastern Standard Time, so uh, I don't want to go too far over. I know. Uh, can Can I just say? Can I just say that anybody who buys a Losmandi product will probably be pretty happy with it too. Yeah, the the um, I've been using one in my backyard observatory for 
uh, since last century. And um, yeah, it just works. It works fine. Um, it's very easy to use. Um, it might not have some of the specifications that the fancier mounts have and some of the uh, through the, um, you know, some of the wiring, the cabling doesn't go right where the a modern mount would. But, you know, my AP-1200 doesn't have that either because it was built before that became popular to have cables running through the uh, deck X or the RA axis and stuff like that. So you're going to miss some of those things. And uh, Gemini 2 had some quirks for a while, but it, it's pretty much straightened out. Um, and a Lozmondi product runs like a tank. Um, except a lot smoother than a tank normally would run. So uh, who was it? Whoever it was, Jamie, Jane, Jane, no, whoever it was that was asking, Linda, uh, somebody was asking a question. What about the, just make sure, you, you were asking about the GM811, just make sure that whatever you get can handle the weight, okay, uh, as far as the Los Monde goes. If, you, if you've got a bigger scope, you're going to have to go to the 11th, the Titan, or something like that. The GM8 was built to go visual with a C8. The G11 was built to go um, uh, visual with a C11. So that's a, about what you can put on there going visually. Photo photography has more requirements on it, but they're they're both pretty adequate for you know given the given the to, if you put the right weight up there. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Alex. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, thank you all for uh, watching tonight. I hope we covered a lot of stuff. This, I think, was a good open session. Uh, even though we went a little bit deeper into a lot of the stuff, uh, I, I think I got to sell uh, a few uh, pieces of software, Pix Insight, a few books for Warren and uh, Sequence Generator Pro. I'm sure my commission checks are in the mail. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, next week's session, I believe we're going to go over some setups that were seen at uh, World's, uh, World Star Party? Winter. Winter, Winter Star Party. Even though the chief uh, photographer will not be there for that, Josh, I won't be able to be here next week. i got to go to I'm going to AIC. Oh, and everybody come we'll up and see us at AIC. Yeah, come up and see us at AIC. That'll be fun. All the greatest astroimagers in the world and a lot of klutzes like me will be there. Okay? So... All right. Thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, definitely check us out next week. Please submit your images to the Image of the Week. Uh, if you also, as always, if you are proficient at any area of astrophotography and would like to present or know someone who would, get a hold of me via our website's contact form and uh, let me know you're willing to present. Let me know they're willing to present. Uh, we'll get them on. We'll learn, we'll, we'll learn them how to... Uh, use all this Hangout stuff or all this YouTube stuff, and uh, uh, we'll be able to cover more topics that way. Thanks again. Good guys, see you uh, next week. Good night. Good night.